Okay, Adam, you're live. You want to introduce? Awesome, sure. Yeah, welcome everybody. Thank you again for joining us for our third installment of our birds and beers in this COVID world that we're we're living in. I'll give everyone a second to kind of pile in. While you arrive, if you want to, feel free to share what you're drinking. And if you've had any cool birds in your yard or patch lately, I'm keeping with my bird themed beers. I have a Whippoorwill, it's a wit beer from uh, Fonta Flora up there in North Carolina where one of our guests is from today. So it's my first one, not too bad. Even though it's not my go-to style, but it's tasty. But yeah, share what you're drinking. If you had any cool birds, I had my first of the year Magnolia Warbler today. Uh, what else? A county first bay breasted, so some good stuff moving through. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm excited to see y'all getting stuff down in Atlanta, too. Um, we had, uh, see, things have kind of cooled down where I am, for the most part. Most everything is up north, but I did go out this morning and walked around and, you know, saw a lot of female birds. Saw my first female hooded warbler of the year and um, nice. some singing worm-eating warblers. And I finally got finally got some ears on uh, rose-breasted grosbeaks, quite a few of them around in that little woods area behind my behind my house. It, it could just be, you know, I don't know, some sort of social media bias or people posting photos, but it seems like it's been a great year for, for gross beaks down here in, in Georgia. There's lots of people reporting them with their feeders. It's also been a really strong spring for Kate May. I don't know if you guys experienced that yeah. in North Carolina, but there's just been loads of them um, down here. So we'll see. Um, all right, a few other housekeeping things just as, before we get started. Of course, I have to say as a, a husband and a son of two moms, a mom and a stepmom, uh, Mother's Day is this weekend, so don't forget that. Uh, maybe you can get her some, some food delivered or something like that if, you, if you've forgotten at this point. Um, a few other Atlanta Audubon events, we're doing virtual bird walks every Friday morning. So we had one this morning that I thought was pretty good in, until my phone died, uh, which was somewhat embarrassing. Um, but if you're sitting around uh, your computer at 9 o'clock Friday mornings, uh, check that out. We'll continue to do that until who knows. Um, I know we're going at least another week or two, um, so keep an eye out for those. Uh, on Tuesday the 12th, uh, our buddy Stephen Ramson, a local birder, photographer, uh, all things nature, he's doing a free workshop webinar on how to edit any images that you shoot in RAW, kind of how to take photos and then how to clean them up. And if you follow any of his pages on social media, you know that he takes amazing shots. And then a little bit further out, but on June 7th, uh, we have our next Early Birds Book Club, uh, which is Feathers, the Evolution of, the nat of a Natural Miracle, excuse me, by Thor Hansen is the author. So please look that up. And all of our other resources are just at atlantaaudubon.org slash digital resources. And one more thing before we get started, I already shared my beer, but I got to give a shout out to Red's Beer Garden. They're here in southeast Atlanta, I think kind of the Kirkwood area. Um, they will deliver for free if you spend 20 bucks anywhere inside the perimeter. So if you're looking for good beer in Atlanta, you should consider uh, getting some from them. Um, as I started doing last time, I'm going to sprinkle in some trivia questions uh, before and after each of the speakers. So this first one's kind of tricky, but we'll see how we're doing. Uh, the first question is in 1810. Ornithologist Alexander Wilson collected a warbler in Mississippi, giving it the English name Black and Yellow Warbler. This warbler is the only one with an undertail that is white, tipped, and black. So what is this species? You can just throw that in the chat box or keep it in, in your head until we uh, get to the answers here at the end. So I'm really excited about our panelists. They've all been great uh, in the previous meetings, but I, I have a few that I think are especially special this time. Uh, I'll run through those. We have Nate Swick from the American Birding Association. We have Alex Dumas, who's a biologist and bander in charge at uh, Tadoussac Bird Observatory up in Quebec. John Roden, Senior Director of Birds and Communities at National Audubon and a good buddy of mine. Katie Barnes, who's a Coastal Stewardship Manager at Audubon, Louisiana. And Rob Ritma, who's the owner of Savory Nature Tours. So Nate, we're going to go ahead and kick it off with you if that works. Sure, go for it. Awesome. So I guess just tell us what, what you're drinking and, and how's life been, uh, all things considered. Uh, so I'm drinking some Lagunitas. 
I got it from the Instacart. So uh, <laughs> it's what's available. I don't get the uh, the joy of like going to the beer store and like browsing the aisles and picking something really interesting. So I kind of have to go with uh, what I know is good. So yeah. um, that's what I got here. Uh, things have been going pretty well. Um, you know, here at the ABA, we've been trying to do a lot of, uh, well, here at the ABA, we're kind of all over the place, but, you know, in my purview at the ABA, we've been trying to do a lot of kind of interesting virtual things to try and keep the birding community kind of aware of us, aware of birding, knowing that there's still stuff going on out there. And uh, so we've been doing virtual bird clubs every couple of weeks on our various social media feeds. And we've been, um, Greg Neese and I, who's the web web developer uh, at the ABA. We've been doing a What's This Bird thing in our What's This Bird group. We've had a lot of every Friday at around one o'clock. We've had a lot of people that have come by and, and you know, ask bird questions and we tackle them live as best we can. And um, they've been doing the ABA podcast. So, you know, most of the stuff that I've done for the ABA has been online anyway. You know, I was working from home before that was like mandatory. So, <laughs> Uh, things have been things have been pretty normal around here. The only difference is now I've got my entire family uh, here as well, so I'm kind of responsible for uh, you know at least touching base with as far as homeschooling is concerned. And my kids, I've got two elementary age kids, and my wife is in academia. And she was usually home a couple of days a week anyway, so it's not too different. But she's doing meetings all the time too, so it's it's change. It's difficult. I'm sure everyone is sort of dealing with that in some way as well. But uh, yeah. we're managing. We're doing the best we can. Nice. Like you said, with your kids, I have a two-year-old daughter in a relatively small apartment. This is my third one Ew. in, yeah. in my bedroom, my living room, and now I'm in the nursery. So I'm just trying to find anywhere that's quiet and the Wi-Fi is still. <laughs> yeah, somewhere. exactly. Uh, this is uh, this is our, like our <laughs> spare bedroom, which has always been sort of my office. And it's also the place where like the extra video game TV is. So like trying to get work done while my son is like talking to his friends and playing Fortnite on the TV behind me has about broke me uh, two months in, so <laughs> we're, we're nice. managing. Well, I, this is probably, uh, you know, most of the people on here are familiar, but I guess briefly describe what the ABA is, or maybe more importantly, how it's different from some other board organizations. Sure. So the American Birding or sort of American Birding Association is um, a membership organization. We do a lot of kind of outreach for the birding community. Uh, you know, if you want to think of the major bird organizations in, in North America as what they kind of are focused on, I, I see like, you know, ABC is very bird conservation focused and Audubon is very kind of bird conservation-y too. They've got their hands in a lot of different uh, areas, but the ABA tries to be very birder focused. So we try and advocate for birders, we provide resources for birders to help make their birding more enjoyable, um, be that, you know, identification articles in our magazines, uh, celebrations of people's milestones if they have them or free resources like the American Birding Podcast and our various you know online media things. Uh, we try and be you know a voice for for North American birders or for birders in the U.S. and Canada as best we can. Nice and what can people do now uh, to support you guys? Well you can certainly become a member <laughs> apa.org slash join um, yeah you know like a lot of nonprofit organizations we're getting hit from a lot of different directions because of COVID. You know, a lot of nonprofit orgs get a lot of their revenue from advertising revenue. And I'm sure Rob will talk, you know, we have a ton of partners in the tourism business who are absolutely getting hammered these days. And, you know, it's, it's rough, you know, there's a lot of kind of second order uh, things going on. So one of the things you can do is certainly join the ABA, or even if you don't, we have a lot of different membership levels. You can get a print membership or you can get an e-membership, you can get our magazines online. And, uh, or, you know, just join any of our groups, follow us on, on social media, participate, uh, listen to the podcast, things like that. There's a lot of little things you can do at a lot of different levels to help support uh, the ABA. Nice. And, and you mentioned the podcast. I, I'm a huge podcast person in general, but I'm oh, right on. pretty confident I've listened to all, all of yours. Uh, wow. All right. Cool. Thanks. All right. I'm pretty committed. Um, and for those of you who don't know, I haven't met Nate, but on a recent podcast with Jason Moore, who's obviously a friend of us down here in Atlanta, Atlanta, Atlanta Birder, you kind of threw out the open invitation. So I figured I had to reach out to see if. if oh, you... no, it's been cool. Um, you know, I, I think it's really interesting to look at the different ways that different birding communities have sort of managed to, to 
stay together, right? Because we're all kind of doing our own thing at home. There's a lot of local birding or staying at home, but you know, there's still a need for birders to communicate with each other. You know, the sharing of information has always been such a huge part of our community. And to be able to continue to do that, even virtually, uh, has been great. And so I've kind of sat in on a few birds and beers uh, of various different sorts all over the country. And it's been really neat to see different, the way different organizations kind of tackle the same the same problem of connectivity when we can't be really be connected. <laughs> nice. So when you're going about thinking of, uh, of an episode or planning for future episodes, mm -hmm. what is that process? Are you going for diversity of topics? Are you aiming for a certain audience, whether it be more experienced birders or new birders, or are you hoping to inspire action or a little bit? Of yeah, that's a good question. Um, a lot of times I'm trying to find just something that I'm personally interested in and hoping that, you know, when I talk to somebody, my interest goes through uh, so that other people will be interested in it as well. Um, part of the reason that we started this podcast and why I got involved in it early, early is because I was, I was a listener to a lot of different bird podcasts, but none of them were quite what I wanted in a bird podcast. So I essentially just kind of put together something that I would really like, and I really hope that people will kind of come along with me on it. And uh, the response has been really great. Um, you know, as far as whether we want to go into the weeds and stuff, the ABA has always sort of had a reputation as being a very, you know, serious birding organization. Like you, people only want to join the ABA if you're like really into the fine points of identification. But um, I, I didn't want it to be just for that. But I have been really satisfied with the fact that when we have done that on the podcast, like people have come with us on that on that journey. <laughs> and sometimes it is a journey. Um, but, you know, I figured as long as I'm, talking to interesting people and and trying to make it really trying to be as personable as I can be uh you know people are going to come with us on that and I've been really happy to see people who are relatively novice birders and have told me that they're relatively novice birders who have been interested in episodes that maybe we went a little into the weeds um so that's been that's been kind of neat I want to be able to you know extend that hand to kind of bring them to you know however they want to bird you know there's we, we say at the ABA there's a million ways to bird you know, we want to provide people with the opportunities to do what they, to take this hobby wherever they want. And if it's like going to the landfill and looking at goals, then, you know, we're here for you. But if it's like looking out your window and enjoying the birds at your feeder, like we, we can do that too. There's like, we all sort of enjoy that no matter how long you've been birding, whatever you do, like there's a certain, like you can enjoy that stuff too. So. And someone asked what the name of it is, but it's just the American Birding Podcast. American Birding Podcast. Yeah, we yeah, weren't I'm very, sure weren't very clever your, at the name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you can do it on your website. Uh, I normally get it on Spotify. It's in my feed. I'm yep. sure pretty much anywhere podcast. Yeah, all the various podcast dispensaries, places where you get them, were there. You can always get them at aviate.org slash podcast. You can find a list of all of them. Is there a, a guest or a, a topic related to birding that you haven't touched on yet that you're hoping to in the future? Well, I will say it's funny. Um, I've been talking to people at the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center about the shade grown coffee. Yeah. And it's a topic that we've kind of had on our radar for a really long time because the ABA sells shade grown. We, we partnered with a um, Thanksgiving coffee company out of California and they, they roast a coffee for us that we sell with the ABA brand. But it's been a topic that I haven't really found the right person to really talk to about it yet. And um, they got in touch with me. I mean, this was only like a couple of weeks ago and um, they gave us a couple of names and one of them was like, I mean, this is like a researcher who's doing work on bird populations and shade grown coffee, but she's also a real advocate for shade grown coffee generally. And also is doing some cool work with like shade grown chocolate and shade grown tea, which is like questions that we always get about that sort of stuff too. So it was like, man, this is, this is it. This is the perfect opportunity. So um, yeah, I'm looking forward to exploring that and that'll be, you know, later on in the year. Nice. Um, so in addition to the podcasting, I believe you're in charge of organizing the rare bird stuff for the ABA, or at least you give an update. Prior mm -hmm. to yeah, this, the weekly thing. Yeah. Prior to this COVID world that we're all in now, how big of a chaser were you? And do you have any noteworthy trips or misses or anything like that? Yeah, you know, I, I used to be a pretty serious um, state chaser, at least. Uh, before before kids kind of put the kibosh on that a little bit, but um, uh, yeah, you know, I've I used to be pretty serious about that. I've been less so now. Um, I I really get a lot out of like getting bringing kind of younger birders, like we, you know. So here in North Carolina, we have a ton of research institutions and a ton of big universities that tend to have a lot of young people coming through, um, and as graduate students and whatnot. And I really get a 
you know, I, I get a lot out of like bringing those people into this sort of birding community that we've, we've curated here and, uh, you know, bringing them into the North Carolina community and making sure people know who they are and they're plugged in in all the right ways to get what they want out of it. And, um, that's been a lot more satisfying. I, I made the mistake of like, um, asking, you know, talking about my total ticks, you know, all, all counties all together added up together in North Carolina. So we have 100 counties in North Carolina, which is kind of a perfect number for that. Yeah. Sort of <laughs> and I made the mistake of, of uh, kind of bragging to a friend, a younger friend about it. And he just went ahead and like got really into it and kind of blew me out of the water. So um, <laughs> I guess I can say it's satisfying. It's sort of frustrating. And then it becomes satisfying after a while once right. it kind of leaves me in the dust. But yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm, I really like county listing uh, more than just about any other kind for the most part, just because I like exploring my county and my area. Yeah, I've, I've transitioned to that quite a bit the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. Georgia's a pretty big state. I've been here for almost five years. And a uh, ton of counties too. Yeah, and even in Atlanta, trying to you know, cut across town is difficult. So <laughs> it's been a bit bigger. And uh, I've, I kind of live in one county, but I've always been a neighboring one. I'm right on the border. And now I'm kind yeah. of back to my home county a little bit more this, this year. It's been yeah, I mean, you know, all that stuff is totally arbitrary. I mean, it's the right. most arbitrary form of birding there could possibly be. But, you know, if you find these little joys in it and, the, you know, finding something that's slightly unusual in my county, like a dick sizzle. I found some nesting dick sizzles in my county a couple of years ago, and that was kind of a really exciting thing for me because that's, you know, next county over, there's a bunch of them in the fields right. where they hadn't, like, crossed over or people didn't know about it. So that was kind of neat. You know, filling in the little gaps on status and distribution in your state is really kind of a satisfying thing. So you've written a couple of books and one of them which I have not read is the beginner's guide to birding. Uh, oh yeah. And if I understand correctly, it's kind of geared more towards the non birder or the, or the bird curious maybe. Bird. Yeah. That's the idea. Yeah. And, and I was curious since I assume most of us here are probably bigger birders. Maybe there are some newbies here. Is there anything from that book that you would suggest us birders take to try to pull more people into this hobby or get people more familiar with birds? Yeah, I think um, I think one of the things that people can do when they're novice birders to really get involved in it is just to go out and really become aware of the stuff that is immediately around you. Um, one of the things that, I mean, I know that, you know, you get to a certain point in birding and you want to start like going beyond your yard, beyond your neighborhood, beyond your county, whatever. And all that stuff is amazing and wonderful. But, you know, sometimes that feels like awfully big. And I think once people realize that there is so much that's going on, even in their neighborhoods, you know, wherever they are, there, I mean, you can learn a ton. And, and this is the thing that I've sort of realized more than most, more than most things, perhaps during this COVID area, like when I've been forced to this bird immediately in my neighborhood rather than going to the places I normally would this time of year. Um, and there is so much going on and it's just a matter of perception and like realizing that that stuff is going on. And once you kind of get that little inkling, once you get that, you know, foot in the door, um, there's like a whole world out there that, that people can, that is totally amazing that people can appreciate. Um, so just like start small. And I have, from my experience, most people you know, it doesn't, it does not take long before you're ready to kind of broaden those horizons. Nice. Uh, I guess since you're talking about birding small, have you had any new yard or patch birds since you've been? Oh man, however. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I've been doing this thing. I don't know if you guys are familiar with uh, fantasy birding. Yeah. So Matt Smith is a computer programmer. He created this whole fan fantasy birding thing. Um, but he's done something a little different with COVID and he's really encouraging people to do what we're calling like the yard squad. So the ABA put together this team, team uh, of board and, of staff and board. And um, essentially the idea is that we all go out and bird in our immediate area and then we collect, uh, make a collected checklist with everybody. And so, um, and you're kind of competing against these competing against we're getting blown out of the water. Uh, we're competing against these other teams. Um, so it's, it's encouraging you to like to get out, even though when you're stuck. So I've discovered this like little trail and this power line cut behind my house that I like, I'd, I've lived here for like five years and I had no idea that this was back there. And so I started walking and it connects to this trail system. That's city property. That's part of a watershed of one of the, you know, res drinking water reservoirs. And I found like, 75 species of birds in like the last two weeks there just birding that area uh pretty regularly and it's been amazing uh it's been just really exciting and uh you know i take my kids out there when they're you know in the mood and it's been really fun to to check this part area this area out that i had no uh, no idea about no see here's here's 
Nice. <laughs> so I, I got one, one more question for you. I was absolutely, I, I remember this from an earlier podcast and in preparation, I was for your Twitter feed and I oh, was man. excited to see that you kind of picked up on your task of renaming birds that have an honorific name, <laughs> uh, yeah. from, you know, this is all, a whole discussion that maybe you could touch on briefly, but I just didn't know if you had a favorite of those that you made suggestion. Oh man. So I did a lot of that when I was bored in an airport last summer, so I don't necessarily remember a ton. But one of my favorites is that um, is uh, for Bicknell's thrush, uh, changing the name potentially to like Adirondack thrush, because I really feel like people have a real connection to places more than they do to some guy that they've never heard of or never would think. And when you have, you have a name like Adirondack thrush, it immediately puts you in mind of a certain place in the, in, in the world. And so many people have such a, a real passion for that place or a real interest in that place or memories of that place. And you're immediately kind of, you know, invested in that bird in a way that you might not have before uh, when it has big no stress. I'm not, a, I mean, all this is sort of fun. I'm not, you know, advocating to change any of these honorific possessive names, but I do think it's kind of an interesting um, exercise to think about, you know, what these names are for, what they were for back then and how that has sort of changed how, you know, the, what the need has changed, you know, in the 21st century, you know, with back then it was, uh, you know, ornithologists trying to, you know, parse things out for their museum specimens. And now, you know, we have tons of birders who are out there trying to identify birds. How useful are some of these names? Um, so it's just kind of a fun exercise, but yeah, yeah if I could change any of them right now, I would change big nails thrush. Okay, man, that's a good one. That's a personal one for me. I did my graduate work in the Adirondacks. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Posed to my wife on one of the high peaks and white face. Oh, nice. And was right there big nose fresh singing? Right before I proposed. Maybe about a half nice. hour before I proposed. So there she, you go. She all gives me crap because I had to burp <laughs> before I, I you know, No, I hear you. I've been there. <laughs> so, well, Nate, I really appreciate you you joining us. Yeah, uh, man. Great. And I encourage everyone to check out the ABA and, and especially Nate's podcast. Um, it's a lot of fun. And now they're going to be weekly. Is that correct? At least yeah, we're going weekly. We've got nothing else to do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Nate. And if you are able to stick around, you know, if anyone has more questions for Nate specifically, uh, or we'll throw out some other group stuff at the end. So right on. Thanks again, man. Thanks. So before we hop on to Alex, uh, I have another trivia question for you guys. Um, Nate lives in North Carolina, which is where I had my first paid bird job. I spent a summer in the Outer Banks doing bird research. What large dark swallow that nests in multi-hold boxes and gourds did I study? So a big dark swallow that uh, there's a huge roost of them out in the Outer Banks that if you're ever there, you should go check them out. Um, all right, so our next guest is, I just call him Alex. Alex, you can give me the whole rundown <laughs> of your name if you like, but Alex is the biologist and bander in charge uh, up in Tabusac. Is that close? Yeah, that's good. Okay, perfect. Hey, good to see you again, man, by the way. Yeah, thanks, to, thanks for the invitation. It's for, really appreci appreciated. Of course. Uh, are you enjoying a beverage by chance? And, and how are things for you up north? Yeah, I'm enjoying that. Uh, it's a French name. So in English, okay. it, it would be translated as more hop and more fresh water. Nice. The country pale ale from uh, Quebec, actually in Eastern Township where I'm living. Cool. And uh, things up north, well, it snowed this morning still. But I mean, it, it, an inch on the ground and it lasted a couple hours. So uh it, it's spring now it's 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 getting there the warblers are starting to arrive i mean uh mainly yellow rumps palm warblers uh i saw i heard um a black-throated green last this week that was my first rare warbler not rare but like it's not the traditional yellow rump um but it's still pretty quiet i mean uh, it's still around hovering around four degrees at night and like 10 degrees in the day so but it will it will get moving soon enough yeah we're, we're just now starting actually i had a, a nice group of palms this morning but yeah the palms and the yellow rump seem to be kind of fading fading you know they'll be gone soon and i was actually hoping today i went to a spot where connecticut warblers show up so i was hoping i still need that for georgia uh, yeah. No, no luck this morning, but uh, yeah, that's, a, that's a good one. I'll try again. Um, but I guess we can start. Why don't you tell us some of the projects that you oversee or that you work on uh, up at Tadasac? So, so basically, I would say, well, that for, first of all, Tadasac Bird Observatory has been started since 1992, so we're in uh, in our 28 years now, 
Uh, our main project is uh, they all hover around uh, population monitoring. Uh, we did a lot where we're still going for raptors. We're kind of like the main point for raptor counts in uh, in Quebec. Um, but later on, like last, lately, we've been moving more towards modus tracking. Uh, the main one we're doing now is the Rusty Blackbird, which we uh, also uh, went in Atlanta for. But we're all also touching with uh, on American Pipit, uh, Horn Larks, uh, Chimney Swifts. And um, so we do standard, we call it here like in, in, well, you guys have the similar protocols also, but it's, standardized banding and standardized visual counts to have like population trends on the raptors and my and and pass rains also i think most people who are on here are are familiar with with the idea of banding in general but i guess can you touch on why banding is a vital component of research and then you mentioned modus um can you give a, just a brief description of modus or some of the other technologies that you guys are using yeah, I'll start with the why is important. Why banding is important. Well, more and more. Well, nowadays banding is actually less important in a sense of uh, just for counting birds because we have tools like eBird, uh, and then we've also have discovered sites uh, similar to Cape May or the dunes in Tadoussac or the tip of Long Point. It's actually feasible to visually count the birds in the standard way year after year to have an idea of their, if the trend's going down or up. But bending will always be useful to gather information on uh, the individual condition, how, ma how much fat, what's the mass, what's the health of the bird, and also on age and sex of the population, which is very important criteria as in if your population is healthy or not, and uh, to take decision if we conserve them or not. As far as mode is, MODIS is a network of uh, multiple partnerships. I mean, I can't even name all of them now that they're so numerous, but it started in, uh, in Nova Scotia in uh, about like 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago. And basically it's a network of ant uh, antenna that support receptors. Uh, there's about 800 spread out in North America and uh, the way the technology works is that those antennas, they can detect any frequencies uh, that goes through them. So, uh, and, and through the frequencies of the tag, you encode the uh, and identity of the individual bird. So basically we can now put very small tags on the bird that weighs the, the smaller we use at Tadasac is about 0.2 grams. So that's fit for birds that are like, 10 to 12 gram, like a black pole warbler or a, a northern water trash, like the bigger size warbler. Yeah. And uh, so we can fit them on, on them and then we can follow them through, uh, throughout their migration, either, uh, either down during the fall or up during the, the spring. Do you have off the top of your head any notable stories of individual birds, either maybe one that you've recaptured over and over or one that's really old or one that was picked up, you know, pinged a modus tower somewhere further south. Is there anything that pops up to you? Uh, well, we had um, we had a bird that we caught uh, two fall ago, a rusty blackbird. We caught it in uh, Tadasac and it wintered in North Carolina and we have multiple detection on the antenna. So we, we know for sure it stayed, it stayed there for a while anyways. Yeah. And um, uh, last year we were catching chimney swift late July and uh, one of them we detected by the end of September or early October all the way down in Panama. Uh, so th those are the most notable for Tadasac uh, detection. And the cool thing with your chimney swift work is I believe maybe that bird also these are from natural nest sites right? Is there, at least that's what they're working on now not not chimneys but actually looking for hollowed out trees and kind of how they used to nest pre, you know, development. Yeah, exactly. The, the Chimney Swift project is we catch birds when they're roosting in the spring. We fix, we fix a transmitter on them and then we wait a month uh, before like they go out in their natural nesting sites. And the, the objective is to uh, find out what's their natural habitat because 
we all know that they nest in hollow trees, but there's only, uh, just in Quebec, which is a big province, uh, there's only six records of chimneys with natural nest. Mm -hmm. So we have, and throughout the literature, it's the same thing in the, in the US and out in, in other provinces that the, there's very, very few information on what's the size of the tree, what's the species of the tree, but most of all, what's surrounding the tree. So we don't know what we have to protect to save the nesting sites yet. So that's what we're working on. Very cool. Well, some birders might be aware, or maybe they remember this story, but they didn't know it was there. But a couple of years ago, your part of Quebec became very famous uh, when a group of birders, including you know, Ian Davies from Cornell, they recorded what was thought to be the largest warbler movement ever, I think, or at least the largest documented. They had over 700,000 individuals of 108 species on their eBird checklist, which you should go check out if you can find it. If you look up Tadasac and warblers, I'm sure it'll pop up. But some of these numbers, they had 70,000 plus yellow rumps, over 144,000 bay-breasted warblers, 108,000 magnolia and Cape Mays, individually, 108 magnolia, 108 Cape May, 70,000 Tennessees, it's the craziest eBird checklist ever. Um, so my question for you was, why does, you know, why does this happen there? I know this was an extreme event, but you, you get big waves like that. And what's your best birding day uh, around the dunes or around the observatory up there? Uh, so basically, that's a, the spring pro. That's our spring project. We're starting it. I'm leaving there on Sunday, actually, because we got the go that we were allowed to do in the spring in the midst of the COVID. Uh, so basically what happens is that where Tadisac is, the, the, the St. Lawrence is about 20 miles wide. So, and it's, if you have a map of Quebec in your head, the, the, the St. Lawrence is oriented from southwest to northeast. So when the birds arrive from the south, from either west or east of the Palachian, it doesn't ma really matter. When they try to cross the St. Lawrence, the south and west wind will overshoot them and they will go too far. So what happens is come the morning, the bird use uh, temperature cues, visual cues, and they realize they're too far. So even if we're in the spring at Tadisac, all the birds we observe, they're going south. They're go they're, they turn around and they go back southwest because they went too far. And if the weather conditions are right, the wind will push them against the shore and then it will create, as, as Adam said, the biggest concentration of the war of, of warblers probably seen in, in North America on some days. That, I, I was actually, you mentioned my biggest day. Well, I was there on that day. Okay. Yeah. On a different <laughs> side because we didn't used to count on the dunes. Now we're back on counting on the dunes, but we were counting at a place that's about 50 kilometers away from there. And we don't have the same counting ways, so we, but we had a, a checklist of 180,000 warblers. And the way we count is, is that we counted every single bird on oh, that wow. checklist. So no estimation at all. And uh, it was crazy. There was warbler everywhere, like low at, at all the altitudes. Like some of them were like two inches away from the ground and some of them were 500 meters in the, in the, in the air and they, tons of different species and, uh, so yeah, it's a pretty spectacular phenomenon when it happens. So you, you mentioned earlier, moving away from the warblers, uh, that you've done some work with rusty blackbirds and, and you and I met because you came down and we tried to catch some birds here in Atlanta with minimal success. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what is, um, what's special about rusty blackbirds and, and what's some of the causes of their, their steep decline? So rusty blackbird is, uh, apart from grassland birds, is the steepest declining bird and uh, past rain birds in, uh, in Canada. It declined at 85 to 90 percent in the last 50 years. Uh, it's a bird that's found throughout, mainly throughout the boreal forest. It nests in marshland in the boreal forest and it declined because of the loss of those marshes and probably because also of something happening down south that's part of the project uh, on the wintering areas. So basically the one of the re first research question we have to answer to protect the species is um, there's two different populations. There's the population that nests in Quebec and in the maritime province of so Newfoundland, Nova Scotia. And then there's the Western population that nests in Manitoba, Ontario and more in the prairies and uh, they don't winter well they, that 
the theory was they don't winter in the same areas and and but it hasn't been confirmed and there was two studies that were showing it was uh they were contradict contradicting each other so we're, tr we're putting modus tag to see where the populations are wintering and uh, and at the same time we want to use the fact that they're those birds are already tagged to study where they stop over and what's their phenology to see where when and where they're most at risk throughout their migration someone had a, a follow-up question to your warbler count so how i guess it briefly explain how you actually were able to count that many birds so when you had 108,000, is that just a, an underrepresentation? but that's you you could actually count that or how many people or, or what did that look like well, actually, we were we are a big team. We're well, we're we're six or seven in the spring. Uh, that day we weren't bending because it was like kind of like a speedy weather, so it was wet, so we couldn't open the nets. So we all, all went to the counting area, and um, and basically we separate the sky and uh, and four, and then there's two two or three scribes, and. Um, the goal is not necessarily we if you go see our checklist you'll notice that a lot of our birds are on un, unidentified because gotcha. our data that we want is the number uh so but all the birds on that species on that list have been counted we count by like oh there's there's a group of of 100 well i don't count one two three four five six seven but i count like five ten fifteen and uh but it's not an estimation of passage rate and then we try to, there's, there's someone also that goes around and just tries to ID as much as possible. That makes sense. Uh, all right, I got one more for you. Uh, a couple of years ago, Canada uh, held a vote to select their national bird. And the winner was the gray jay, which is now changed names. It's the Canada jay. Yeah. Uh, would this have been your pick or was it your pick? Or would you pick something else? And there was talk about the snowy owl, yeah. Uh, but the snowy owl is already the Quebec bird. And but I think the gray jay is a good one because it's a wintering bird. Uh, it stay like it's a resident bird that stays with us all winter and that survives a Canadian winter. And uh, I don't know if you guys have ever seen a, a, a Canadian jay now, uh, but it's a very like gnarly like it's very tough bird and has a very complex behavior so yeah it's a very interesting bird so that would that would that was my pick actually awesome well alex thank you so much for your time man it's good to see you again pleasure to, good yeah. to see you too enjoy your spring migration uh, yeah thanks <laughs> all right uh my third trivia question i was a little insecure about it because i think it may be changing a little bit but i think uh, you can still guess what it is so we just talked about jays which are corvids uh, I said, what corvid endemic to the U.S., even though I think this bird is starting to, to creep into Canada quite a bit, but what corvid endemic to the U.S. is commonly found in Georgia? So a bird primarily of, of the southeast that's expanding north. Uh, all right, so next we're going to go to John Rowden over there at the Senior Director of Bird Family Communities at National Audubon. How's it going, John? Good, Adam. How are you doing? I'm doing great, considering... Uh, is it too early for you to be having a, a beverage? <laughs> Are you having some iced tea or something? Or how's I'm going? still on the clock out here <laughs> in California, so I'm just having some um, seltzer right now. There we go. I, yeah. I tried to push this late simply that's, to get John okay. to have a beverage with us, but that's okay. I understand. It's all good. <laughs> um, but yeah, can you tell us? I mean, I'm sure most people are can understand what bird friendly communities mean, but if you can give us the elevator pitch on, on what your job is, that'd be awesome. Sure, I'm happy to. So yeah, so I oversee the bird friendly communities conservation strategy for Audubon, which is one of our five of our conservation strategies uh, and seeks to make our communities better for birds um, because I believe in my heart that that also makes them better for people. Um, and we really are, um, we use framing around providing birds with food, shelter, safe passage, and places to raise their young. Uh, and that's both for our um, resident species, migratory species, wintering. Um, so kind of thinking about the full life cycle of the birds, how do we support them in our communities? Um, there's a, a couple main programmatic areas that we focus on. So um, we have what's called a Plants for Birds program, which promotes the use of native plants in our communities. Um, I can, I can, 
this is an elevator pitch, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail yeah, about no, why no, native no. plants are better. Um, <laughs> or you can follow up with, with some uh, yeah. other questions yeah. on it. But I, we have a, a very broad and deep scientific understanding about why native plants are better to support our native bird species. So we uh, work very hard to promote that um, and to facilitate that around the country. We have a database that people can use to locate native or to identify native plants for their area that support birds. Um, it connects them through to their local Audubon for support and local retailers. Um, we have a whole bunch of um, resources online and we, my, the small team that I direct um, creates a lot of those resources to support our network of chapters and centers and state offices to, um, to do that work. Uh, and then the other main programmatic area is a, um, what we call bird-friendly building. So it's really helping birds navigate the built environment, both um, the challenges that are presented through reflective and transmitted glass surfaces and light, artificial light at night. So again, so, sort of sitting at the national level, what um, my team does is produce resources um, and try to support local efforts like the fantastic work that you do in Atlanta that um, you direct, Adam. Awesome. So that's the, that's the quick and dirty sort of. No, that's good. That's perfect. And we actually had a, you know, we normally host or partner on a few spring plant sales. Uh, we did do an online only plant sale with social distancing pickups uh, the past couple of days. And it was pretty successful considering uh, the, the last minute change. So yeah, get out there and get your native plants uh, if you haven't. This is, uh, I think, a, maybe a loaded question, but what is your vision of a truly bird-friendly community? What, what does that look like? I know you talked about the programs, but. Yeah, no, that is a great question. And I think that as we've, so we um, formalized this about three years ago as a strategy, like how we wanted to, um, to move forward with it. And, I, and so we did really focus on that programmatic work. Like what do we wanna coalesce our network around? And it does then beg that question, like what is the broader vision for a bird friendly community? I mean, I think that um, what I want to see is I increasingly want to bring more of um, an environmental justice lens, if you will, to this work. So how do we actually work with communities to identify the conservation challenges that they face and the birds face in their communities and then co-create solutions for them? So that's, that's a that's in some ways a specific yet vague answer, right? Because it will not look the same in every community. You know, if we're talking about everything from New York City to, you know, Opelika, Alabama and Venice Beach, California, where I am, it's gonna look very different. But I think that what we need to do um, is really work effectively in those communities with them to identify those challenges. We're always gonna have these programmatic and our scientific understanding because Audubon always brings in scientific lens to it. But I do think that we need to think about what is it that communities identify and need on their own to help establish that as well. So it's, it's a dynamic process and I'm not gonna, you know, that, that's sort of my vision and how I wanna actually keep moving forward with this as we, as we you know, envision that across the country. Yeah. Um, so one, there's a video, which I believe it's your voice going over when talking about bird friendly communities and, and you say, how birds can lead to a more equitable communities. And I you talk about some examples or, or how so. Yeah, so I think that there's, um, there's some examples. Like I used to, um, before I was in my position at National, I worked at the chapter in New York City and I did a lot of work with um, community development organizations in the Bronx where we were looking at how do we actually um, clean up the Bronx River because that's, you know, and that Bronx River, I don't know if folks are familiar with it, but right, flows right into, um, into the upper uh, bay there by Rikers Island actually. And, um, and it drains a lot of the Bronx and there's a lot of communities that are adjacent to that. Um, before we started really working there, there wasn't a lot of understanding even of what birds use that area and people thought, oh, well, it's not actually really that commonly used by birds, but I was working with a lot of students in that area and we were doing bird surveys and we were in some cases um, putting the first lists that had been done for that area in eBird and identifying what, what birds were seen. And of course we were seeing plenty of birds there, um, but it hadn't been identified yet. And so we could actually then identify 
what was, you know, where the areas that the birds were using, where the people needed to have access to that, that, to that waterway, and then we could identify and target where we could actually work on, on more effective ways to clean that up. So it just, you know, like I, I came in as, as the bird person and I always had that lens, but I had to sort of put that behind me and say, what do you guys want? What do you want to get out of this and what is important to this community? And I think that that kind of model um, is what we're trying to pursue more effectively across the country. You, you threw it up a Leica, maybe just randomly, but one of our- I um, did. I don't know why. <laughs> oh, no, that was the question. One of our local Anna Birders, uh, who's a friend, of, a friend of mine said, oh my gosh, I'm from there. She didn't know if that was a specific example or just a random name. Yeah, it was totally, ra I pulled it out of thin air. I usually say Dubuque <laughs> for some reason when I'm trying to think of a, of a place, but I think that since I was, since we're in the Southeast, somehow Opelika um, that works. came into my mind. Yeah. Uh, what are the biggest hurdles do you think to having your vision or having all of our visions uh, of a more bird friendly community? What, what are some of the problems or not problems, but obstacles? Why, why, why isn't every plant planted a native? Well, I, I think that there's a few things. One is there is not universal awareness of that importance of that. Um, and that's something obviously that we're trying to, um, to change. I think there is, there's been uptake on that, um, you know, and I of course have to give a shout out to Doug Tallamy and his work. Um, Doug, for folks who don't know him, is an entomologist at the University of Delaware and an awesome human. Um, just the nicest guy and has done a, an incredible amount, him and his lab and, and graduate students who are now working around the, um, the world on this to have identified this really close relationship between native plants and native insects, which provide food for birds. Uh, so that's really the scientific, that's a very synopsized version of that scientific, a lot of scientific research. But, um, you know, we've been doing a lot of evangelizing around this to raise awareness about this. And I think that there's been some um, uptake of that. Um, I think that we have to, one of the things that, that we've tried to do in the program that I run is create a lot of that awareness around it. And now we're pivoting more toward how do we reach scale, right? How do we actually achieve more broader impact? And so that can, there's a few avenues for that, right? So one is um, just availability of that to the consumer. So retail availability is important and we're working on some um, national partnerships that can help bring more native plants into the retail space that people can access them. And the other is, I think, legislation, right? So how do we actually work with municipalities broadly defined, whether that's anything from a homeowners association to municipalities to states to the federal government to encourage or mandate the use of native plants um, in public spaces, right? So I think that to your question, how do we create, what, what are the the barriers or the challenges, I think that we have to raise awareness and we have to actually create systems where change follows that. And um, that's something, so the Audubon Network is taking that on by doing things like um, working with municipalities to pass legislation. We have two examples so far of states that actually mandate the use of native plants along rights of way. And I'll give shout outs to the states. It's New Jersey and North Carolina. North Carolina is getting a lot of um, <laughs> accolades here, but, it's, but that's great. And you know, I would love to, we're, we really want to continue to build that kind of momentum around the country so that there's um, understanding and then actually there's buy-in at all levels to change it. You know, it's an unfair question that people always ask, oh, do you have a favorite bird? Or for you, I'll say a favorite plant. But for a combo, I want to know if you have a favorite or a memorable bird-plant combo. Whether it's a bird that loves a certain plant, you know, you see the goldfinch on the echinacea or something. Or for me, before I even knew native plants, I have this very vivid image of a black-footed blue warbler on a beautyberry branch. And so I just didn't know if you had a native plant and bird if it could be a, sing a singular experience or just some sort of combo or or you can just tell me your favorite bird and your favorite plant. Yeah, no, well, I'm going to I'm going to go a little bit far afield on this cuz the yeah. actually one that really popped in my mind is so I used to live in New Zealand. I was um, I spent some time down there and I worked um in native species conservation which was an interesting experience for an American to go down and work um, in, in that realm. I worked a lot with kiwi and um, kakapo, which um, 
if people don't know, the kakapo is, um, it's a flightless parrot, it's a nocturnal parrot, it's a really fantastic bird and extremely rare. When I was there, there was 86 of them and it was well known the exact number because they are so rare. Um, and they're, um, it seems like their life cycle and their breeding cycle is tied to masting of a particular tree called the rimu. So if the rimu isn't reproductive and isn't producing um, seeds, the kakapo just sort of shuts its breeding down. And we were fortunate while I was there that there was a big masting event of rimu and it actually caused uh, um, some really successful nesting of the kakapo. So, so that, again, that was the first one that came to mind because there's that such really direct connection and such, such a, um, a significant, you know, a, a really um, uh, incredibly important connection between the bird and the plant. Well, I, I did do some diving, and so I did have a, a question here. For, for what it looked like, or I think I read you did some graduate work in Australia. I and did. I don't know where I heard it, that it seems like you weren't a huge birder before going there, and that maybe your spark might have happened when you were over there. And I didn't know if you had an Australian spark bird. Is there something over there that really got you going on, on birds? Yeah. So, so just the backstory is I, I, I went to graduate school in zoology um, at Duke in North Carolina. Again, there's this, all these connections. Um, and I was, not, um, I was not taxonomically driven. I wasn't driven by birds. I was more question driven. And uh, it just turned out that there was this system of um, Australian parrots that really lent themselves to the type of of question that I was interested in studying. So I got into birds that way, kind of backed into it. Um, but it wasn't really until I went down to Australia and what I was doing was I was going all around the country um, taking footage of these um, species that I could then analyze digitally and just spent lots of time in the outback just sitting, watching, wait, and mostly waiting for these parrots to show up at their nesting sites. Um, but you know, you're in Australia, and so I would just look around at the rest of the birds, and it really did, it just blew my mind because there's such an incredible avifauna there. I would say that, I don't know if this is, I mean, like the, the, the fairy wrens are really spectacular little birds and very, um, very, you know, kind of cheeky, just out there, you know. Um, so I would, I think that that's one that I really remember I mean, my parrots were pretty special birds, by the way, but the fairy wrens, because they, if, if there was no parrots to watch, the fairy wrens were always putting on a show. That was, they were pretty spectacular. Awesome. Um, so you, you set me up nicely for a Duke question I had for you. So I know you spent some time at Duke. I'm not sure if you're a basketball fan. I'm not sure if you're allowed to go to Duke and not care a little bit about basketball. My hard hitting question here is what bird is the Duke of the bird world? Or, or the U.S. <laughs> you mean the, the bird that people that like it, like it, and everyone else hates it? That <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Whatever, <laughs> however you want to define it. <laughs> um, you know, ugh, that, that is a tough one. And, um, I'm, sort of, I'm sort of weirdly tempted to say the European starling. Okay. <laughs> because I actually... You know, when I used to teach ornithology, when, you know, I would, I would just encourage my students, I would say, go out and look at things like pigeons and starlings, the birds that you can see, like just, just because they're ubiquitous and they don't belong here, doesn't mean that they're not amazing to watch, right? And so I, I'm, I myself am kind of hating on starlings right now because they're going and they're eating all the flowers off of my um, fruit trees. Yeah. But, um, uh, but they're pretty, they're pretty gorgeous birds if you actually can sort of step back and look at them. And, you know, when I, I feel like when I'm in Europe and I'm seeing them in their, in their native space, I have a totally different appreciation from, oh, they belong here. When I'm here, I'm like, they don't belong here, but they're still pretty special birds. All right, I got one more uh, funny one for you. Not funny, but just, I know you've been in LA for a while now, and before that you were in New York, and I was just curious what your experience is, how's the these two major cities and do you have a preference i'm i'm not birded in either i guess i birded in new york a little bit but i kind of envision new york as being central park and these hot spots and you know you get these cool wayward birds and la county is famous for having such a huge species total i just didn't know if you had a, a preference or or 
what your experience has been looking for birds around your home where you are now and where you were before. Yeah, well, so there's a couple different ways to approach that question, right? So now I have a home with a yard and I can actually, like I've landscaped it with native plants and I'm just sitting here, you know, the Allen's hummingbirds are over at my, you know, sage over here and the bush tits are, you know, like I just have a lot more proximity to that in my daily life, which is a real difference to me. Um, uh, I think that, you know, my, it, it is that sort of feast or famine in New York, right? When you, when the, when the warblers are coming through, when everything's coming through Central Park, you just get that incredible diversity. Um, and that's, that's a pretty spectacular thing. But I do actually really love here in Los Angeles that I can go in a single day, you know, particularly in, in winter when we have the wintering um, waterfowl and everything, I can go and I can see, you know, three species of loons and sea ducks and everything that's, that's right here in Venice where I live and I can drive up to the mountains and see, you know, the white-headed woodpeckers and the green-tailed towhees and I can see all of it in the same day very easily, species that exploit such different habitats and that's, it's a pretty special thing here in Los Angeles. Awesome. Well, John, thank you so much. I hope you're off the clock soon so you can uh, start your weekend. Thanks yeah. so much, Adam. Appreciate your time and we'll talk soon for sure. Okay, thanks. Um, before we hop on with Katie, I am having a beer for John. So I'm moving on to an Orpheus beer, which is another Atlanta. We look at the green screen. That's kind of cool. But with a nice great horn now, it's a, an IPA. So I'm excited to move on. Um, all right, next trivia question. Um, what brown and red bird native to where John now lives, which is LA, was introduced to his former home, New York City, in the 1940s? This was after they failed to sell as a cage bird, despite their name that connotes the film industry. So a bird that is from out west and now is all over the place. All right, so we're gonna move on to Katie Barnes, who's the Coastal Stewardship Manager for Audubon, Louisiana. How's it going, Katie? Good, how are y'all? I'm doing great, and you told me on Instagram that you had a bird-themed beer as well. Have you already drank it? I have it right here. <laughs> awesome. It's, a, um, it's from the Crying Eagle Brewing Company in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Nice. Hot-blooded IPA, it's very good. <laughs> are you from Louisiana originally? Nope, I'm originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Oh, really? Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, well, I guess, can you kind of describe what the average day is for you or what your work is on the coast? Sure, yeah. So, uh, like John, I work with one of the strategic plan initiatives of the National Audubon Society, which is coasts. And I monitor and protect beach nesting birds through our coastal stewardship program. And here in Louisiana, we have three vocal species, the least tern, the common nighthawk, and the Wilson's plover. And all of them readily nest along Louisiana's coast. So in the summertime, whenever the birds are breeding here, we have seasonal staff that are out monitoring these birds. So we collect scientific data on these birds as well as uh, protecting them through stewardship and educating the public. So lots of outreach and tabling events, which of course aren't happening this year, with COVID, um, but our monitoring and stewardship occur every summer and we're able to understand more about the birds every year as far as uh, their breeding densities and their nesting success and the challenges they face, like your new uh, background there. It's very, very nice, uh, very appropriate. Uh, so yeah, it's, uh, it's, really, it's, it's really nice work because we were able to have, it's a pretty dynamic uh, position as far as my position. I do, I mean, so I'm the manager now of the program. I, I was a technician for three summers. So I did three seasons with Audubon Louisiana and I also worked with Birmingham Audubon, now Alabama Audubon for a year and a half. So I have about five years of coastal stewardship experience in my background now. And now managing the program, I get to uh, dive in a little deeper with um, helping train staff and being able to facilitate all of that and get to um, work on other things scientifically. So I get to, you know, help with more, more of the, um, you know, anal analysis type stuff. I get to at least get the data together and start putting all of that together and start to answer these big questions. And uh, here in Louisiana, 
there is a lot around our restoration. So Louisiana has a lot of restoration projects going on and those are very large scale projects. And those are all in response to the Deepwater Horizon oil spill money. So uh, the settlement money, a lot of those projects are coming from, um, are being spent and the money's being spent to do these restoration projects. And a lot of it focuses on barrier island restoration and beach renourishment and marsh creation type projects. And we're able to look at how birds respond to those those types of uh, projects and if they are beneficial and what we need to do as far as post management of those projects. So those are some of the big questions we do. And uh, that is my clock <laughs> telling, me <that> it's <laughs> telling me that it's seven o'clock. So yeah. Um, we had a few people ask who, who your friend is, if you can introduce. Uh... Sure, yeah. Uh, this, is my, this is my parrot. He's a, um, a monk parakeet. He's a blue mutation. They're usually green and gray. They're the ones that you see, the wild flocks that you see in several areas of the United States. Uh, I had gotten him from Florida, actually in a newspaper ad when I was in college. And I saw his picture in the paper. Some lady had bought him and had him for about a week and realized that her African gray parrot was super jealous. So um, she ended up putting a, an ad in the paper for him and uh, I got him for a little bit of money and I've had him for almost 12 years. So we've been, we've been buddies since he was six weeks old. So he's, he's loving all of this Zoom time <laughs> for sure. Um, we had one question. Someone asked earlier what Dottie and I, we have some birds in our background. Dottie has a great cat bird. I had an Eastern bluebird. And now I have, I'm not sure if it's big enough, seven shorebird species behind me. <laughs> I, I see some, on, yeah. <laughs> I took on the Georgia coast. I, pre-COVID, would be leading a shorebird trip this weekend uh, to the coast looking for, you know, uh, horseshoe crabs and all the knots and everything else coming through, but uh, a, a different time. So, yeah, I'm out for that. Um, so, I knew a little bit about you, Katie, from when we met at the Audubon Convention and from social media, but mm -hmm. doing some research about you, I found the story of Mr. Orange. And so, I yes. give us an abbreviated uh, recap of who Mr. Orange Sure. Sure. So, um, so the blog about the, the Mr. Orange is actually on our website, so you can read sure. you can read it whenever uh, you wish. But it's about a snowy plover that was banded in Alabama, and the bird was um, so it was banded in Alabama. And I, at the time in 2017, was working in Louisiana, and I had spotted the bird and reported the bands to Eric Johnson, who ended up finding out that the uh, the bander uh, lived in, or the bird had been banded in Alabama. And so uh, after that year, I had moved to Alabama in fall of 2017. And I, and uh, I saw the bird in Alabama several times, as well as every time I'd come back to Louisiana. So the bird basically was following my route uh, back and forth. And so it's a, it's a story about uh, seeing the bird in um, multiple multiple seasons, multiple states, multiple years. And so it's a really cool article about our blog post about um, our little story and how many times we've run into each other on the beach. So it's a, it's a really cool uh, experience to be able to run into the same bird and, and those bands. It's super special to, it's almost like you have a connection with that bird. So it's definitely super special. Yeah. yeah. And how frequent or how many uh, lovers do you have in Louisiana? Was it a how many plover? Uh, no, he's, I don't even count. But snowies? Is that a, yeah, is that a, or, or do they breed there? Or do they just migrate through? Yeah, so actually, so that's actually a really good, uh, a good topic. So snowy plovers are actually rare nesters in Louisiana, and um, we they overwinter here, and the habitat in Louisiana is super muddy from the the river, the river delta, and snowy plovers really like that open, uh, open sandy beach type habitat that you see in Alabama and Florida, just white sandy beaches, nice open areas, whereas it's more vegetated and marshy and muddy here, which is more favorable for Wilsons. This is what we have most of. Um, but here, actually last season, I had found a snowy plover pair with a nest. Uh, and it was probably the first one in maybe seven years or so. Um, and uh, it hatched. We put up fencing around it and it protected it and, and it hatched um, through, you know, our protection efforts. And then um, this season, actually, we had a pair return to the similar spot. The birds aren't banded, but we're presuming that they're probably the same pair and they had a nest. Um, they, have, they have a nest this year. 
So it's interesting that, uh, you know, uh, that also not on top of, on top of uh, Mr. Orange, we actually have, you know, some, some snowy plovers that are nesting here now too. It's almost like, you know, this connection with snowy plovers are following me around in Louisiana. So it's pretty cool. Not a bad connection to have. Yeah. Like, yeah. They're cute little birds. Yeah. They're, they're, cute. Too, they're tough in Georgia. There's been a couple hanging out on our southernmost bear island the past couple of years, but I haven't yeah. got them yet in the state. Um, have you been to the Rice and Rails Festival? I, I've not been yes. to bird festival because I normally am working or doing field research or something. And that one's yeah. it's been high on my list. And so if you have been, I would love to know what, whether you went as a guest or if you were doing some banding or just your general. Uh, sure, yeah. Um, yeah, I've gone about four times now, about four of them, uh, four or five of them. Awesome. It, it's a very awesome experience. It's, it's a, one of the most unique bird festivals. It is a really cool way of working lands and how, wor how working um, you know, farmers and working with ag the agriculture and the birding communities and how they unite and being able to work together to, to see some really unique birds, which of course is the yellow rail is the, is the target, but there are other rail species that are utilizing rice fields as they're migrating. And so it's really neat to be able to be a part of that. Um, I'm usually a part of it as a volunteer and a banding facilitator. So I usually am out in the rice fields um, following the rice combines and um, we have mist nets and we're catching the rails that are being flushed from the rice combines. So as the rice is being harvested, um, the birds are being flushed and kind of concentrated into little pockets in the rice fields. And as they get to that last cutting, there's an explosion of all the rails that come out and we have a bunch of, of nets lined up uh, to catch them in the corner of the field. So it's really cool experience to see these birds up close and they ban we ban them right on the site. And so it's really cool for people to see the birds up close and also get images of them and see them from the sidelines. So it's really a really unique experience. Yeah. Very cool. I'll make it one day. I still need to yell. Yeah, you got to do it. It's really cool. I, need yeah. I, I encourage everybody on this, on this call to go to the Yellow Rails and Rice Festival. It's, yeah, it's right at the end of October, beginning of November every year. Did um, you spend some time at the CRBO, the District of Bird Observatories? Is that correct? I did, yeah. So what I was. What station uh, were you at? Uh, I actually was at four different stations. Oh, okay, I was great. rotating. So I got to, um, so I worked with Pablo Elizondo. So he's the executive director of Costa Rica Bird Observatories. And he hired me as a bird banding intern there. And so I got to uh, ban tropical birds in four different um, regions of the, of the country. And so I was in. Guanacaste, San Vito, Portuguero, which is the Caribbean Slope, and then um, a lot of my time was in Madre Selva, which is in like the Serra de la Muerte, uh, yeah, cloud forest area. So I got to, it was really neat to be able to experience public transportation and be able to get out to, to all the different areas of Costa Rica and see the bird diversity change based on where you were. So it was a really cool experience to Ban birds in the tropics use sugarcane poles instead of metal conduit poles like we use here in the U.S. It was really neat. And sometimes you would you would grab a sugarcane pole and it would be full of termites and it would just explode with termites in your hand. So it was a definitely a, a wild experience. So it was it was very neat uh, to see those birds up close. Yeah, yeah I, I led a group of Atlanta Audubon members down there in January, and we got to go to the Madre Selva station. We were able to. Ah, cool. And, and make a donation and everything. And I was going to ask, what are some of the differences between, you know, your experience banding in the U.S. versus in the tropics? And I guess the poles is one of them. And if I'm not mistaken, they were still working, or it's, I'm sure it's a, con a continuous work in progress, trying to come up with something even close to the pile guide that's used by bird banders. Uh, is, there's no reference like that. Is there for Costa Rican birds or for tropical birds? Um, like a field guide, you mean, or no, you know, like a, like a an very, aging guide, like a very detailed, yeah, aging, sexing, you know, molt, something like the Peter Pyle reference books. Yeah, so there is a book that just came out uh, yes. by my boss and Jared Wolf. So Eric Johnson and Jared Wolf had put out a book called um, Molt and Neotropical Birds. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but uh, it's yeah. very in depth as far as it's it's with mainly Brazil. Um, Brazilian uh, species, but so that most of the work was done there, but it's, it does cover a lot of tropical species. So there's definitely, um, and they, they use a different molt system there. They use the WRP system 
which is now being more adopted in in the US, but um, it's applicable here as well, but it, and it's more specific as far as plumage and, and molt goes. So it's nice to be able to get uh, the experiences of, of how birds are aged and the diversity of birds there and taking it back and, and putting that in the calendar year versus the WRP system of aging and, and molt. So I know there's that book that ex exists. I don't know if there's a Costa Rica specific one um, to my knowledge, but I know um, that Chespi is his nickname, Pablo, um, Pablo's nickname, Chespi. Uh, he, yeah, I mean, he's, he's an ABC trainer and so North American Banning Council trainer. So he, um, yeah, he's very familiar with a lot of all the, all the birds that we know that, that we call our birds, right. you know, spend a lot of time down in Costa Rica. So, so he's very familiar with, with our birds, for sure. <laughs> And I guess I'll get you out of here. I was when I asked earlier if you're from Louisiana. I know you're there now, and you did some graduate research on Louisiana water thrushes, also. Right? <laughs> yeah, the irony of that, right? <laughs> yeah, the Louisiana connection. So you did yeah. stuff. Now you're a shorebird, you know, coastal person, but a lot of shorebird work. Yeah. Yeah. So, what's, what's your preference? Who wins, warblers or shorebirds? <laughs> That's a tough question. I love all birds are my favorite. Uh, <laughs> When I, you know, when I started, when I started diving uh, into field work and started doing a lot of different field jobs, I really wanted to hit all the different habit, uh, habitat types. So I actually worked in the desert with some, with the southwestern willow flycatchers. Uh, so in southwestern Arizona, I was working there a couple of seasons. I worked in Rhode Island on some migration work with passerines. I worked at Powder Mill Bird Banning Station, um, which is a very high volume station. Uh, that catches hundreds of birds in several hours. Um, and yeah, so I had a lot of pastoring experience before shorebirds and worked in the forested streams with Louisiana water thrush for my master's degree. And uh, yeah, the irony of me now being in Louisiana for almost five years at this point. And uh, yeah, it's a pretty neat, it's a pretty interesting connection. But now, yeah, I, I before, right before shorebirds, I was working with red cockaded woodpeckers. So I do have like a it kind of went all, hit all the habitat types. Those piney awesome. woods, savannas, those deserts, you know, the tropics, like going to all the different places to, to really get an, a grasp on all the different, I just, because I, I love them all. They're all very interesting and uh, they all have different strategies and it's just really interesting to me. And yeah, to, when I lived um, in Deritter, which is a small town, West Central Louisiana, where I was working with red cockaded woodpeckers, uh, I knew I was only a couple hours from the coast, so I'd start finding myself in Cameron Parish a lot doing some birding. It's a very popular destination when you're in Louisiana to go bird watching. And uh, yeah, then I found out that there was an opportunity to go and actually work with shorebirds in Cameron Parish. And I'm like, I can, I can get on that. <laughs> that would be fun. So and I, yeah, I got hooked. And so now I'm, I'm doing primarily shorebirds at this point. So um, but you know, bird, you know, I still do songbird branding from time to time, but, um, for the most part right now, it's, it's primarily helping those beach nesting birds and, and working with, um, Audubon Coastal Bird Survey program. So I've been trying to build that up a little bit more, getting our volunteer base out to help us with getting surveys done and right. getting some more coastal, uh, coastal bird population data. So it's important. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Katie. It was great. To yeah. Up and, and to learn more about you and all the stuff you're doing down in Louisiana. So, yeah, so. Well, thanks for having me. It's great. Oh, of course, of course. Thank you so much. All right. So, before we move on to Rob, I got uh, another Louisiana or a Louisiana based trivia question. Maybe easy, might be easier for some of the old, older birders among us. What wading bird used to be called the Louisiana heron? <laughs> so, if you have an old golden guide, it might still have that in there, uh, something like that. My first field guide definitely had that. I, I was still interested in all the name changes. Um, all right, our final guest, Rob Ritmo. Thank you so much for hanging out for an hour and 15. And, Glad to be here. Uh, yeah, uh, I appreciate you putting in the time, but I figured you'd be a great closer for us. So like I said, uh, I, I thank you very much. Um, are you relaxing anyway? Do you have a, a beverage or, or, or anything like that? Or are you ready? I do. I have a Maker's Park and Ginger Ale whiskey. There you go too so i'm on i'm not tonight very cool well um rob you're still in indiana is that correct i am yes okay cool so uh i 
Rob from when I was in Indiana. He and his brother had a what, Nutty Birder website. Is that correct? Yeah, that was uh, yeah, that was kind of where we started out with things. Was, uh, yeah, I used to check that out quite a bit when I moved to Indiana, and I think I might have crossed paths with you once or twice down at Goose Pond chasing a red shank or something oh, yeah. good down there. Um, but Rob is now like the owner of Saberwing Nature Tours, and I I guess I thought it'd be a cool way for you to start. How did you get into professional guiding and then into owning your own operation? Yeah, we had um, the group of us that have been guiding for a, a lot, a long time on different trips. You know, local things in Indiana, taking people out of state, just with local autobahns, uh, things like that. And when I started getting involved in the biggest week in American birding in Northwest Ohio that should be starting tonight, um, I met Brian Zwiebel, who is a really well-known. Uh, wildlife photographer and he had been kind of doing the same thing he'd been leading on the side bird photography tours and had been throwing around the idea of a, starting a tour company and so him and I partnered up uh, to create Saberwing Nature Tours and, and start uh, leading professionally with our own company. How did you guys land on Saberwing as your, your, your logo and your name? Did you just like um, it? Yeah you know, it's a great tropical hummingbird. And a lot of the work that we were starting to do as we started the company was in Central America. Um, our logo is a, a violet saber wing, um, which is one of my favorites. Uh, so uh, just kind of kind of big, bold uh, hummingbird to, to fit for our logo. Off the top of your head, do you know how many saber wings you have on your life list? I don't. I, I'm not sure. I only have three. I, I was checking when I thought of this question. I was like, I should check how many I have because I knew I had... I, Violet and Rufus, and I kind of forgot about Wedgetail. Was Wedgetail, yeah. Three I have personally. I have a few others than that. I, I couldn't tell you how many, though. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm really bad at keeping track of exactly what I've seen all the time. Um, do you have a location that you haven't led a trip yet that you hope to in the future? Um, Southeast Asia is somewhere we'd really like to get involved in going forward. Um, we're really throughout Latin Latin America, I'm um, doing a little bit in Africa. Um, the closest we've kind of gotten to Southeast Asia so far is Taiwan, but I'd really, really like to drop into, you know, Borneo, Indonesia type stuff sometime soon. Get to Australia at some point would be really good. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely high on the bucket list for me. Oh, yeah. Um, to transition a little bit, you co-founded the Indiana Young Birders Club. Yeah. How did that happen, and are you still involved in any way with, with youth birding? Um, so, uh, my brother and I uh, started birding both when we were, my brother was actually 10 when he started, and I got involved a few years later as a teenager. Uh, we were the only two kids we knew that birded at the time, and so as we got a little bit older, uh, one of the state Audubons here in Indiana, um, Indiana Audubon, who's not actually a national affiliation, but it's a local state, Audubon had, started, had talked about starting a young birders club, so we got involved in helping start that up then. Um, we built the club up. I'm not as involved in Indiana anymore, um, but through my work with Black Swamp Bird Observatory in Northwest Ohio, I am involved in Ohio Young Birders Club as well, which is kind of where all the Young Birders Clubs kind of started to get their get their start there was in, in Ohio with Ohio Young Birders Club. So we actually had based our Indiana group on them when we started it. Perfect. And, and you led me right into that. So you, you serve on the board, Black Swamp, uh, and I wrote in my question, I assume you had planned to be at the biggest week, which is starting this weekend, right? Um, yeah. I guess my question is, why is that event so special? I mean, besides the obvious warbler fallout, but what is your connection to that place and to the birds there and to the people? Yeah, my, my family's been going to bird up in Northwest Ohio for almost 20 years. So I remember McGee Marsh when there weren't that many people at McGee. Uh, some of the locals call it the good old days. I like what we have now, personally. Um, I like the crowds. I like the people that we bring in. Uh, my association with the festival is actually, I coordinate all of the field trips for Biggest Week in American Birding. So I would definitely be there right now on the start of my exhaustion scale for the week. Uh, today, I'd be, I'd be good tonight. Um, but, uh, the, you know, the festival is so special for who it brings in and, and the people from all over the world. Uh, they get together one time a year, some, a lot of people one time a year at Biggest Week, and um, just, just an incredible event to be part of. I've always been somewhat embarrassed. I'm from Columbus, Ohio, 
And I got into birding at 16. I actually took a class at Ohio State, a one credit class when I was in high school, up at Stone Lab, which is their Sea Grant campus on the island in like the area. I visited all those spots, but in June, it wasn't that birding. And then I'm, you know, have never gone up. I didn't have good birding friends in college. And I birded around Columbus and I went up north, but I never did the biggest week. And it's been 13 years, I guess, since I moved away and it's just never worked out. So we just got to get you back up there. I know at some point I need to get back up there because it's, I do feel embarrassed being in Ohio and who hasn't done the biggest week, but um, we'll make it happen. Yeah, got to get you back up there sometime. So one question I had for you and, and I, so I'm starting to lead, you know, a trip here or there for, for Atlanta Audubon International. <laughs> And I had such a great time in Costa Rica. And one question or one thought that I always struggle with, and I'm curious your, your views on it, do you get more enjoyment or more excitement from visiting a new place with a tour or going somewhere that you've already been before? So either the new place, you know, you're probably going to get new lifers and new experiences, but the old place you kind of have that, that experience and that knowledge, which is always kind of comforting and exciting. So I didn't know if you had a preference. Well, I like both. I mean, I, I like to take groups to places I know. Yeah. Um, and I like taking groups to, to places where I know the locals, I know the local lodges, I know the employees. Yeah, that's really fun. And then you get to show people the amazing birds that you know are at those locations. Um, if I'm, if I'm going to explore a new area, I like to do it you know, on my own. And that's always fun, too. Uh, I think any birding is fun. So. <laughs> <laughs> But no, I love taking people to the, you know, to the amazing lodges that we, you know, we support throughout the tropics, especially um, that I'm, to be honest, slightly worried about now with COVID, yeah. everything being shut down. Um, you were, you were in Costa Rica, you and I ran into each other in Costa Rica. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they've been shut down pretty good for over two months now. So I've been thinking about them a lot. Um, do you have a favorite story from guiding abroad, whether it's a bird or a near disaster that turned out great, or is there anything that sticks out, some memorable experience? Luckily, no near disasters. <laughs> Good. Um, you know, I, I don't know that there's any one specific event. I love um, when we have people on our trips that are new to the tropics. That's always one of my favorite things, to just see their mind be blown day after day. Um, with things that many of us that travel a lot would consider, you know, relatively common. But when you see, you know, you go to Ecuador for the first time and you have 60 hummingbirds on a trip. And that's just mind-blowing for someone that hasn't ever left the United States. And, you know, maybe they went to Arizona and got 14. Right. right. So that's the kind of stuff I really like. So my last question for you, I'm going to pull in this college basketball theme once again. So I know you went to IU. Uh, I did. That school, and of course, IU is another famous basketball school. So, you know, we had the Starling, I guess, is the Duke of the basketball world. What U.S. bird is the Bobby Knight of U.S. bird? Oh, God. <laughs> oh, I was never a big fan of him. Um, <laughs> uh, something really obnoxious that yells at people all the time. <laughs> You know, Mockingbirds could be, yeah. Another yeah. Mockingbird could be a good Bobby Knight screaming at people at all hours of the day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a good, That's a good poll. Um, well, Rob, thank you so much. And uh, I have one more trivia question. And then if there are more questions from, from the group, we'll tackle those. But um, I hope you're back leading trips, you know, in, in the near future and showing people new life birds. Thanks. We hope so. <laughs> awesome. Um, so my last trivia question, as, as Rob mentioned, um, the last time I saw him was at a hotel in San Jose, and I, I recognized him from social media as we were finishing up our Atlanta Audubon trip. So at that hotel on our final morning, we saw our 382nd species of our trip. And so my question is, what common plover found in Georgia was our 382nd bird of the trip? It was a flyover that was calling. So, there's that. I was gonna say a plover is that's not a bad last bird at that hotel. I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of wasn't expecting we'd get anything new and it flew over. I'm like, oh, yeah, I guess it counts. You know, so. <laughs> um, so, yeah, if, if anyone has any final questions, um, what, what someone mentioned that the global big day that eBird is doing, that's tomorrow. So, uh, you know. Get outside in your yard or go somewhere safely in your local patch um, and look for some birds and, and e-bird that and, and try to contribute to that great fun event. 
Um, let's see what else. Are there any other questions? I had one question I wanted to ask, and I was going to fit it into Katie's question specifically, but then I realized it was kind of unfair maybe to North Carolina and others. So this can go for anyone if you want to unmute yourself or Dottie, if you can unmute them. What state or region has the best bird and cuisine combo? So I think I was I was thinking the rice and rails, and I was thinking, you know, a yellow rail and some, you know, jambalaya doesn't sound too bad, but you know, the barbecue in North Carolina is pretty good. So I didn't know, Rob, I don't know if the, you know, tenderloin sandwich is gonna take how many, you know. Trophy. Indiana's not going to win that. Maybe yeah, he's East Arizona so. with some of the, the Mexican oh. getting up there. Yeah. But yeah. I was going to say, <laughs> go for it. <laughs> if you go down to South Texas, you can get like great like breakfast tacos like right in the service stations right there. That's what we did every morning at the Rio Grande Valley yeah. last year. It was amazing. <laughs> I was going to say South Texas too. We'll give it the championship then. But yeah, I was gonna—I was specifically making a Louisiana question, and I was like, "Oh, it's—it's." It's what about maple syrup and some boreal birds? <laughs> <laughs> when I was doing my my work in uh, the Adirondacks, I would get maple cream. I would be out doing field work all day and just checking nest after nest, and come back and just spoon that. Stuff. <laughs> I'd have to go really slow. And not just pound, you know, a pint of maple cream, which is the, <laughs> <laughs> it's the most delicious thing ever. It's so good. Uh, let's see. I guess since we're almost out of time, I'll go through the trivia real quick. The first one, I guess I wrote the answers, not the questions here. The 1810, the Alexander Wilson collected a warbler in Mississippi, giving it the English name Black and Yellow Warbler. Um, this warbler has a white undertail with a black tip. That's the magnolia warbler. It was collected in a magnolia tree, at least according to Cornell. So that was number one. Number two was the bird that I studied on my first field job. That was my after my sophomore year in college. I was in Manio on Roanoke Island at the purple martin roost there. So if you're ever going on a family vacation to the Outer Banks, you got to go check that out. It's, you know, over 100,000 purple martins kind of late in the summer, and it's spectacular. And martins in general are just awesome birds. Number three, the uh, endemic COVID, or Corvid, excuse me, that wasn't on purpose, um, to the U.S. is the fish crow. Even though it looks like on the eBird, they're getting pretty common, in, or at least in Toronto area, they're popping up quite a bit. Um, but historically, uh, they were just down in the south. Uh, the brown and red bird native to the western U.S. that was taken to New York in the 40s is the Hollywood finch or the house finch. This is all, all over the place down here. The Louisiana heron, number five, is the tricolored heron. And then my last question was when Rob and I were in San Jose, uh, what was the last new bird of our trip? It was a killed deer. So we had all these amazing hummingbirds and, and tanagers and Toucans and toucanets, and then a kill deer was our, our big final send off. So it's it's pretty much eight thirty. I'm cognizant of everyone's time, and and hopefully you can enjoy the rest of your your Friday and your weekend, or however your weekend is these days, which is kind of unique. Um, but yeah, if there's no more questions, or if you have a question, throw it out now. But again, thank you all so much, and thanks for the the panelists and participants who joined, and it was great catching up with all of you. And uh, stay safe and keep enjoying birds and eBird tomorrow for the big day. Awesome. Thank you, Adam. Thanks, Adam. Thanks for having us. Thank you all so much. Thanks, Thanks Adam. Adam. Thanks, Adam. Thank you. Nice to meet you, Nate. Yeah, yeah. likewise. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Bye.